So, okay, um, uh, Jude and Bettina, um, tell us about the latest episode of Perils of Perestroika. Yes, it's very exciting. I have with me today um, Bettina Schroeder, and we are going to talk about East German animation, animation from the DDR or the GDR. I'm going to do an introduction in a minute. Um, but first of all, I want to introduce Bettina herself. Hello, everybody. Um, some, some of you know me already. Um, I'm doing a lot of different things, uh, um, art, music, um, installations, a, a, a lot of things that just come and go, and, uh, but there tends to be a strong strand between all of them, uh, not always visible, but this is an other um, area which I've just recently looked into, which I wasn't really so um, aware of, which is animation. And uh, Jude introduced me to the club, and I was, of course, totally fascinated. And especially when she started doing the Perestroika series, which, um, uh, of course, with my personal past, I was uh, uh, fascinated by. And so hence our meeting. And Jude invited me to talk a little bit about the East German uh, animations. And the only one that I very clearly remember um, from my childhood uh, was uh, Das Sandmännchen, which I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, later. Yes, I'm, it's going to be great to have Bettina here because she has that personal connection between um, these animations when she was a child. And I think probably for myself, it's equivalent to animations like Nog in the Nog or The Herb Garden or uh, many of the Bob Godfrey rhubarb and custard in um, the UK. But, uh, but the Unser's Sand mention is one of those iconic uh, animations that for children that really have stuck with people and we'll find out about that all in a minute so first of all perestroika we're doing this series on perils of perestroika my other collaborator rita hakarainen hopefully will be back for the um for future episodes we're also in talk we have been concentrating a lot on russia in the former soviet um Union, looking at um, animation of the former Soviet Union and looking at this later period, the perestroika period, in which things changed a lot in the Soviet Union and related that countries that had a relationship with that, um, with that model, with the Soviet model, things uh, changed a lot during this period because instead of the because they had a big state funding and state companies for uh, producing animation and uh, things were quite stable in that way within the animation industry. Animators were paid. There was a lot of funds for animation. But things changed very much in the later years. In the 1980s, we had perestroika, and that was the restructuring of the Soviet Union economy by Mikhail Gorbachev, who brought that in. And in some ways, that actually made things quite chaotic for some animators. And we have looked at that in uh, in regards to, to Russia and animation in Moscow, and mostly Moscow, but not entirely. But today, we have a different focus. We're looking not at the main Soviet Union, we're looking at East Germany, um, which is an independent country, but was within the Soviet bloc. And Bettina can jump in and smash me down if I say anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was all correct. <laughs> I'll go first, and then maybe you can add comments and corrections, because uh, I'm a bit of an outsider. My father was fascinated by the former Soviet um, Union, generally. Um, just to explain a bit of family background, we have family from uh, uh, Latvia and from the former, former East Europe. So we had a uh, family over the um, other side of the, the Iron Curtain, I suppose, that, that we didn't see at all. We didn't know them. It was too long ago they'd gone. But I think the fascination always stayed with my father and he used to go over and smuggle stuff over the border and have a jolly lad's time watching spy films and smuggling bits of currency and 
cassette tapes as he went over the border. I went with him a couple of times, but he went all the time. Anyway, um, so one of the places he would go to most regularly was East Germany because he would go to um, what was West Berlin and go over the border to East Germany. And um, people who be who went on the same trail as his would know that outside the zoo in Berlin, there was lots of dodgy deals going down and people used to do black market currency deals there and a lot of drugs and stuff. Anyway, it was... Um, very different times, actually. And I thought I ought to explain a little bit about it as much as possible. Um, so East Germany or GDR or DDR, it's the same thing. GDR is German Democratic Republic. DDR is Deutsche Democratic Republic. And it was an independent country, and but it was part of the Soviet bloc. And within it, within East Germany, within the DDR, there was the section of Berlin that remained part uh, underneath the Allied forces influence. When it became East Germany, it was after the war. So Germany being on the losing side got divided up by the Allied powers and uh, managed by them. And they wanted, everybody wanted a piece of Germany because it was so rich I guess so they split Germany between Russia um, really well, Soviet Union and, um, in terms of influence and then the capitalist West influence but I think Berlin was seen as being so important that everybody wanted a piece of it so they kept uh, this area of the Western allies and the capitalist influence in Berlin and they hung on to it and um, it became very contentious in 20th century history and I think well, people will perhaps not remember when the wall went up in Berlin uh, around the western area of influence in Berlin a wall was built in 1961 I think was the year I got off the uh, internet. Um, I don't remember it myself, but I do remember the wall coming down, which was happened in yeah, 1989, 1990, 91. And things haven't been the same since. We've all been one big happy family, of course. <laughs> Except not, but yeah, always trouble. But yeah, but it's quite a long, it's within our lifetimes, these big, huge changes. Um, we want to look back before the war came down into the animation story from East Germany. And we're delighted to have Bettina here to begin the story with um, Unser Sandmenschen. Um, and after that, we're going to show three films that we have from uh, courtesy of the DEFA Film Archive. And I ought to just briefly explain that the big company in big state animation company in East Germany is called DEFA, which is, oh, it's got a big German word at the beginning. Bettina. Yeah. It, the, 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 das Deutsche uh, um, Film Institute, uh, it's, it's basically DEFA, and uh, so it's Film um, uh, Institute. And uh, they, they were really uh, making lots of different films, uh, not just animation. And they are based in uh, Dresden and Babelsberg, uh, so they had different offices as well. Yeah, and they have become the big license company. And in a way, when you're dealing with DEFA and the archive of former East Germany, it's a bit different to some of the other Soviet Union countries because they were very organized in keeping the national repository of treasure alive and bringing it into the period we're in now there was good continuity whereas that wasn't the case in some other parts of the Soviet Union with the legacy so we, we've got a very good company to deal, deal with and we have got a license to show these three films tonight very kindly and yeah we paid for it as well <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that that was uh, really great that we actually could get the the original clips from from the DEFA archive. You know that is a real uh, amazing thing to be able to do that, and that they have it, like you said. You know that it hasn't got lost. Uh, that is amazing. Yeah. 
But first, I'd like to, to may I just chip in here. Um, all I was going to say was one of the exciting things about when uh, Jude uh, put together the idea, um, the idea for Perils of Perestroika, partly was the archival uh, element of it, of taking these um, disparate works and um, curating them and showcasing them and so on. And by um, dealing with the, um, the film archive as well, that uh, brings in another element. Uh, as you pointed out, some, some of the work is properly uh, archived and then some of it isn't. So it's interesting to, to, get, a, um, to, to get a balance from sort of both uh, aspects of it. Anyway, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I start talking a little bit about das Sandmännchen, which is um, called in the ones we are showing is called Unser Sandmännchen, which is called uh, Our Sandmännchen, which is the East German version. So it started already off with a political uh, uh, split and squabble because the West Germans made, had the idea, the TV, to make a children's series called uh, uh, Das Sandmännchen, The Little Sandman. It's, be, uh, it's based on a, or inspired by a, 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 a Christian Andersen story. And, um, and so they set to work and it was supposed to be transmitted on TV in the West uh, uh, in December. The East Germans got hold of it or the, uh, heard about it, got wind of it and said, oh, we are doing our own version. So they actually beat them to it and had their version coming out before the West Germans had their version out. And that was in, 19, in November 1959. So that's quite a, a, a traumatic start, really. But what was amazing is that the East German version of the Sand Mansion is totally superior. It is so much better. I looked at the West German version, which was really absolutely boring, average children's story. And the Sand Mansion, the Unser, our Sand Mansion is absolutely fantastic, totally charming. And it already has the name Unser, our, means it's much more social. It's got that element of it belongs to us. It's not just the sand mansion, it's our sand mansion. So there's immediately a social element to it. And um, so that was the start. Um, and so that was shown in East Germany uh, only. And I'm born in East Germany in a small town in the mountains near Dresden. In fact, where the Film Institute is, DEFA. And uh, my family escaped uh, via Berlin, via the air corridor um, to West Germany. And uh, so I encountered the Sandmännchen in West Germany um, when uh, we watched evening program. And normally you would of course not be able to see the East German stations because we were in West Germany. But if you lived near the border like we did, um, then you could set your television uh, um, to uh, receive the East German television. And millions of people did this because it was, of course, very interesting. And my parents uh, watched it uh, most nights because, first because we liked the Sandmännchen and also because we wanted to see the East German news, which was, of course, still interesting to us because it gave you a total different perspective on news. So all the news I've grown up with were always the West capitalist views and the East socialist views. And then you could make your own opinion. So it was actually very good. And uh, but the Sun mention came always first at seven o'clock every night. And uh, they had a special format for it. Um, which was the Sandmännchen would come, travel and visit a family every night. Um, and it would be a family all around the world. It was very international. Uh, and then the Sandman would gather with the children um, in front of a television. And this is the, the animation television. That's all part of the uh, stop frame animation. And, and then they would uh, uh, blend in a film or an other children's um, uh, animation or uh, some other sort of news that is interesting for children. And that was called the story or the Abendgruß. And when the Abendgruß was over, 
Then the Sandman, the camera goes back to the Sandmännchen, and then the Sandmännchen says goodbye and packs everything in, goes back to his travel uh, mode of travel. And um, but before he totally disappears, he has a sack full of uh, sand, and he sort of sprays a little bit of sand into the room, and the children catch the sand in their eyes and they start rubbing their eyes and are tired and that's a sign that they want to go to bed and they do that very happily and the sandman signal is also that's rubbing of the eyes is the sandman signal to totally uh, disappear and go back to his fairy tale homeland um, so that is the format and what is so astonishing about this little character is first he is absolutely charming and irresistible but uh, he was not just entertaining, he also was quite informative about um, a sort of current way of life and what was happening um, in the East Bloc, in the Soviet Union partly, but also of course in Germany, especially uh, with view of technology. So it was a really good way to uh, let children know uh, the, how the future would be, showing the children the future. We have uh, all this technology at hand. So the Sandman would arrive, and this is absolutely fantastic, really, in uh, amazingly exotic vehicles. So he would come in a spaceship, he would arrive in on a rocket, uh, also older things like a flying carpet. He would go to Iraq on a flying carpet. Um, he would be in a Land Rover, uh, he would be in a submarine, uh, very sort of sometimes very James Bond style uh, things. So it was very much sort of what was happening at the time in society and all that exciting new te technology. The Sand Mansion was uh, sort of really up for it and showing the children where the future lies. So that was, of course, totally exciting for a child as well. And um, so that makes it really uh, lovely to watch now as well. And because they had these exotic ways of traveling, uh, like an air balloon and jet planes, um, there was sometimes a political issue with that, not intentionally by the uh, um, animators, I think, but it would occasionally clash with some of the political agendas. And there is one particular uh, funny uh, uh, occurrence when uh, the, they made the air balloon uh, episode, uh, because two days later, no, two days before, I believe, uh, two East Germans had escaped with an air balloon uh, across the border. So, of course, then having the episode of the Sand Mansion using the air balloon was a little bit embarrassing. So the authorities had to then step in and reprimand uh, the, uh, you know, the people at DEFA, you know, this is, you know, and of course that danger was always there because that um, the Sand Mansion promoted, you know, that you go everywhere in the world, which of course Germans couldn't do because international travel was just not possible. And so it, to some extent, it satisfied the East Germans to see all these ways of travel and that exciting uh, in these exciting countries. But uh, it also left them frustrated because they couldn't go themselves. So there was a danger from the government points of view that it would, uh, you know, inspire people to use these ways of transport to to escape. And um, uh, so there, there was always a little bit of a, a free song. Um, and uh, uh, but on the whole, it was just the international aspect was there as well for um, because children were supposed to think internationally. This communism and socialism were international, uh, and and therefore all children in the world are the same, and they all have the same issues. And uh, there was a solidarity uh, 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 or a thinking of a solidarity. And of course, the children should feel that solidarity and that, uh, in, in, you know, not seeing foreign countries or foreign children as, uh, as enemies or um, as people that are less of value. So hence these visits to all the different families all over the world. And of course, you know, that is fantastic. And um, so what I will do, I will show a few uh, clips 
Um, and the first one is uh, a, a classic where the Sandman arrives uh, on a spaceship or one, some, another one part of it is a bit like a spaceship. And then the section in between where the camera goes away from the sand mansion is a little story where a mother with her two children goes to visit the father. And the father works at a petrol station. So they are just going there to visit him and see how he's working. So this is an everyday story, which is also typical for the for the programs uh, where children just learn about professions. So slightly educational. And the second one is um, where the sand mansion um, travels on a boat. And it's a beautiful animation there as well. Um, uh, some painting in the background and he gets lost because there is a storm. He ends up in a lighthouse where he gets rescued for a while. The children want him to stay at the lighthouse, but he says, no, I can't stay because all these children all across the world looking for me. Then there is a pilot in his little uh, jet. He flies all over the world to find the sand mansion because all the children say, where is the sand mansion? And he flies across Moscow as well, uh, you know, everywhere. And, uh, and eventually, uh, of course, the sand mansion is found and can do his job. And the next one after that is the um, one where he is in Africa and he is uh, driving a Land Rover. Very controversial because this is a Western car. So this is not something he should have been driving, really. <laughs> he should have been in his little Trabant. <laughs> and so that was also uh, very uh, afterwards criticized by the authorities. But of course, it's a delightful scene. And it's one of the early ones. It's black and white. All the early ones were black and white. And the sun mentioned wouldn't talk. And later that changed. And then we go on to another clip where he is on a boat. He uh, arrives with the boat, uh, climbs onto a ferry and meets the children there. And then it's a little general animation, it's the middle bit. And at the end, there's always that other scene where the sand mansion comes in, says goodbye, and there is the outro song. So the song that Jude and uh, I were singing earlier is the intro. And then there is always an outro as well, which we will not sing as well, because this is just too much for us. And, um, and the, the whole thing ends with a clip of several uh, modes of travel of the sand mansion. So you get a good taste of all the vehicles he's using. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoy this. And um, uh, yeah, I think we can start with the clip. Okay, so this is the, um, the show reel, as it were, which Jude has uh, edited together. Now, uh, Jude and Bettina, uh, we're going to have to turn our microphones off, I think, in case of any sort of sound bleed from elsewhere. But um, if you could just, um, I'll play a clip and I just want you to, um, if there's any, if there are any technical problems, let me know. But otherwise, I'll just let it play. OK. All right. So I'm going to share the screen and proceed. Thank you. 
Bilder und Fleiß, Geschichten erzählen, die noch keiner weiß. Frag doch die Leute, frag doch die Leute. Katrin und ihre Mutti wollen einen Ausflug machen. Sie werden den Vati von der Arbeit abholen. Das ist Katrins Fadi. Er ist Tankwart. Oft arbeitet er am Wochenende, denn seine Tankstelle liegt an einer wichtigen Straße. Das Tankauto bringt Benzin. Durch dicke Schläuche fließt es in große Benzintanks die sich unter der Erde befinden. Katrins Vati arbeitet auf einer modernen Tankstelle. Hier tanken die Kraftfahrer selbst. Jeder Tankwart hilft, wenn ein Kunde das nicht kann. Wenn diese Lampe leuchtet, ist der Tank gefüllt. Katrins Vati kann kassieren und die anderen Leute bedienen, die an den Tanksäulen auf ihn warten. Katrins Vati ist aufmerksam und hilfsbereit, wenn es seine Zeit erlaubt. Ist die Tankstelle voller Autos, läuft er ständig hin und her, um abzukassieren. Hier wird verbrauchtes Öl aus dem Automotor gesaugt. Katrin und ihre Mutti fahren tanken. Bis sie an der Reihe sind, wird der Fadi auch Feierabend haben. Die Tankwarte lesen ab, wie viel Benzin sie in ihrer Schicht verkauft haben und rechnen dann das Geld ab. Auf einer Insel, weit im Meer, wohnt Leuchtturmwärter Jackenteer mit seinem Söhnchen heim. Zwar fällt's dem Sandmann manchmal schwer, doch muss er täglich hin und her, sonst schläft der Hain nicht ein. Der Sandmann hat ein kleines Boot mit Mast und Steuer, Kiel und Schott und einem Lot aus Blei. Und sitzt der Hain beim Abendbrot, dann lotet Sandmann mit dem Lot sein Boot am Fels vorbei. Das Meer war immer still und gut, doch neulich kam es jäh in Wut mit Wind und Sturmgebraus. Der Sandmann zog sich fest den Hut, wie das ein alter Seemann tut, und fuhr dem Sturm voraus. Die Wellen wogten hoch und breit und bis zum Leuchtturm war es noch weit, auch fing's zu dämmern an. Ein dicker Walfisch hatte Zeit und gab dem Sandmann das Geleit, dass er dem Sturm entrann. So langten sie beim Leuchtturm an. Der Walfisch, der bloß schwimmen kann, schwamm weiter und verschwand. Der Sandmann sprach, hab Dank. Und dann band er sein Boot am Bootsteg an und sprang vergnügt an Land. Da plötzlich rollte groß und schwer noch eine Woge aus dem Meer und packte Sandmanns Schiff. Sie riss es los und nahm es quer und warf es dann von oben her aufs spitze Felsenriff. Das kleine Boot, es brach in zwei, das Lot versank, es war aus Blei, das Segel, 
Tat verwehen. Der Sandmann Sandsack fraß ein Hai, ein Stückchen Mast trieb noch vorbei, dann war nichts mehr zu sehen. Der Sandmann sah erschrocken zu und Wasser lief ihm aus dem Schuh. Im Leuchtturm brannte Licht und Heini sagte gerade, na nu, der Sandmann lässt mich heute in Ruhe, am Ende kommt er nicht. Und Leuchtturmwärter Jackenteer sprach langsam und gedankenschwer, so wie er immer spricht. Bei solchem Sturm, bei solchem Meer, ja, wenn der Sandmann Seemann wär doch das, das ist er nicht. Da klopfte es. Herein rief Hein, das konnte bloß der Sandmann sein, das war den beiden klar. Der Sandmann trat zur Tür herein und er erzählte kurz und klein, was ihm geschehen war. Bleib einfach hier, rief Hein sofort, und schlaf in meinem Bettchen dort. Doch Sandmann sprach, oh nein, ich muss noch heute wieder fort nach Ost und West, nach Süd und Nord, sonst schläft kein Kind mehr ein. Das wäre wirklich allerhand. Natürlich musst du fix an Land, sprach Vater Jackenteer. Doch draußen tobte unverwandt und gänzlich außer Rand und Band der Sturmwind übers Meer. Nun hatte sich in aller Welt inzwischen schon herausgestellt, der Sandmann wird vermisst. Die Hupe hupt, die Schelle schellt in Stadt und Land, in Wald und Feld, wo nur der Sandmann ist. Es suchten ihn die Feuerwehr, die Polizei, das Militär und Flieger Liebetraut. Der flog am Himmel hin und her, doch hat er selbst im Wolkenmeer vergeblich nachgeschaut. Natürlich suchten überall im Wüstensand am Wasserschwall auch Kinder groß und klein. Vergessen waren Reif und Balden. Sandmann muss auf jeden Fall zuerst gefunden sein. Sie suchten ihn im Dschungelwald, im Dom zu Naumburg, grau und alt, in Moskau und Berlin. Am Nordpol, wo es bitter kalt. Guten Abend, Herr Deus. <lacht> Schnippel die Schlappel, die Schere. Einen recht schönen guten Abend wünsche ich euch, meine lieben kleinen Freunde. Ja, da staunt ihr, was? Heute senden wir euch einen ganz besonderen Abendgruß. Mhm. Heute wollen wir euch alle einmal gute Nacht sagen. Ja, sozusagen zum tausendsten Male mhm. wünschen wir euch heute gute Nacht. Ja, ja. Na nu, da kommt ja noch jemand. <lacht>
Okay, we're back, we're back, we're back. All right, and I'm ready to share the very exciting DEFA film okay. that we've got for the evening, Ein Kaffig, Ein Kaffig, which means cage, a cage. And it's interesting because it's made, um, well, one of, it's very interesting anyway, but it's made by the filmmaker Sieglinde Hamatka, and she made loads of films. She's really important. She's, and they've all got her sort of style about them. She, uh, well, I, I don't know if they've all got her style, but she's got a really distinctive style and she uses ballpoint pens to draw. These are hand-drawn animation. She's very much the auteur director of, of these and it's it's surreal stuff. And it's, it's using, I find it interesting because this and a couple of the other films are using the gender, uh, metaphor for things that are bigger than gender the like, what's bigger than gender you mess probably nothing but um they i think there's also p political ideas and other ideas being explored through it and this happens repeatedly in some of the other uh East German animations that I had a look at preparing for the show. And this one caught my eye. I don't want to say too much about it because it's one of those surreal animations that you make up your own mind about. And these three are like that. And let's see it. Sieglinde Hamacher, Ham or is it Hamacher, isn't it? I suppose. Ein Kefig. Do you want to say a little bit while you're sort of uh, lacing up the next film? Do you want to say a little bit about the circumstances about getting the licenses to show these films? Because these films aren't readily available, are they? No, um, mostly they uh, differ uh, pretty on the ball with their um, copyright for their films, and they they aren't out in the public domain. The next one we're going to see actually, um, uh, Klaus George's Gorgie's film. Gor is it Gorgie? Is it? Gorgie. Yeah, that the next one we're going to see actually is uh, also on YouTube, very short one. But um, on the whole, these films I could I didn't find in the even being shared like pirated. So it's really amazing to see the see, see what they had at Defa, and they showed me a whole they shared with me a whole list of films that were um, from the perestroika period that might suit our theme of our show and it was really interesting to see them I mean it's in it's funny when you look at a whole bunch of films like that to pick what's suitable for discussion or for screening because a lot of them um, everything's different and some things are very nostalgic some things don't really fit the theme but I think the three that I chose are really good and, and I really wanted to, I really got drawn to the fact that a lot of them we're not going to see also did have gender um, issues in them and it was like because other things were restricted, gender seemed to sit outside of the things that were uh, forbidden to talk about in actual fact. It's, it, it seemed with these um, with these animations that a lot of them sort of took advantage of that but some of them and the portrayals they ended up doing uh, was quite stereotypical as well and in a way felt a little bit offensive um, from a, a gender point of view not all of them and they were making a point through gender but that seems to be a, a kind of a, a particular danger I think of this particular era of political animation that it was seen as an area to explore issues, but sometimes people fell into stereotypical gender depictions in order to to do that. I don't yeah, know if just my perception, but I, I felt that was a minefield I was walking through. Absolutely. And of course, the films being around about 40 years old, of course, they represent uh, uh, societal norms that are perhaps rather um, out of date now. But I was wondering, Jude and Bettina, um, at the end, can we do a discussion about the films? Because I plan to do a, a, an edit of um, this evening's event and to um, tidy up a few things. But we're not going to be able to show the um, these three films, aren't we? Are we, Jude? So do you want to say a little bit about that? 
No, that's true because we only have a day license. They might let us do, um, I mean, maybe I could ask them if, if they would let us keep it up for a couple, I'm sure that they'd have a bit of licensing as we had technical issues if mm. we keep it up for a short time for our club members only and maybe there's a bit of dispensation. But it's mm. true, it's one night only and um, that's that's how the so licenses I'll, roll. I'll try to I think we should just get the next one up. I okay, should just all right. Keep talking well do you want to say what the next one is while you're lacing up the projector yes it's klaus gorgi who i think is brilliant and there's some of his stuff on um where is it there let me let it's siren and it's about sirens it's just uh, i need to find it now and i need to shut up while i concentrate do that yeah, the pronunciation of the German names can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Do you want to help us out here, better known? And, yeah, uh, so it's Klaus the... Gorgi uh, because the, the the G isn't pronounced G in German. It's G, <laughs> so it's Gorgi, not or like George. You know, my friend in uh, Berlin, he is called Georg. So it's the two Gs and. Uh, if you don't know that, then you, it becomes unrecognizable. And this is one of the pleasures of uh, different languages, you know, that the pronunciation, if you get it wrong, then it totally falls flat on its face. <laughs> and um, this name is normally not a problem because um, you can read it as well, usually um, when it's on letters or in books it's in normal conversations when that becomes an issue. Yeah, oh, Bettina, um, I'm ready now to go. And I thought maybe you could just say that little bit about the Rhine before we um, show the class about what? Irons, about the Rhine. Oh, oh yeah, the river, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so th this is uh, about sirens and uh, it is a classical subject, uh, especially in Germany, the river Rhine, which is one of the biggest rivers going across Germany. Um, it is in the south, it becomes very uh, um, curvaceous and has very steep mount, cliffy mountains. And uh, th th these were dangerous waters in the past for ships. And, um, and there must have been many shipwrecks. And in order to come to terms with this emotionally, this story was told uh, that uh, the reason why these men uh, failed and died and lost their ships was these uh, women, these beautiful women who were combing their hair and singing songs on the top of the cliffs. Um, so it, it has this two-sided thing that uh, Jude was mentioning earlier, you know, you blame the women for it because you needed an explanation that would not was outside the normal experience. So you invented these figures that tempted you not to concentrate and therefore you lost your ship or your life. And uh, But they were very beautiful creatures and they sang, of course, really beautiful, unlike me. And um, But that is part of you know that tradition is comes out in that in that film yeah so this is sirens and i've got my share my screen okay siren yeah so it didn't end up so well <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think the, the women were uh, punished in the end for their tempting songs and beauty. Um, they didn't come to a nice end by the look of it. <laughs> so they, 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 it's, it's a sort of a slightly um, depressing ending because the men are all gone <laughs> and then the women also in, in the in the modern life of it, when they had motorboats and petrol, then they also go. So it's a, it's a strange, very strange, dark story, but very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, it seems very metaphorical, and, but also just about how modern life destroys all things of beauty. Yeah. Even the, the day. The present. 
<laughs> Bettina, something I'm aware of in um, Eastern European, uh, East German films <clears throat> of the time before Perestroika um, often used metaphor to, if you like, encode messages or get across ideas under the radar of the censors. Do you think, can you uh, say something a little bit about that? Are you, is this something you can spot in films of this era? Uh, not, not really, because I didn't have really access. Like Jude said, the, these films were shown once uh, under particular circumstances and you, they were not mainstream. So you would have to be a little bit moving in that world. And of course, me being a child then, I would not have uh, seen, but I remember um, uh, particular ones that I've seen, especially Polish ones, which were, um, there was a Polish magazine as well, which were sort of available when I was a teenager. And they must have had uh, uh, these undertones, but Poland was already a little bit more open to the West, so they had a little bit more freedom. Uh, to express ideas, but I'm sure that a lot of people who were creative would have had uh, uh, the desire to express ideas in, in, in I know it more, more from music, uh, but they were also very openly sometimes expressing things and then got into trouble uh, because of it. Now, just going back to San mention, I understand also that in children's television of that period, the censors were less uh, strict when it came to, in certain respects, about children's television because they couldn't, uh, they assumed that there couldn't be a, a political message encoded in children's television. Mm. Uh, do you think that was the case uh, with San Mention? Although you pointed out the, the non use of a trabant perhaps caused uh, trouble at the time in the, the was, African it, one. I think it, they only noticed after the, it was shown that that would be an issue. They wouldn't have uh, had influenced the making of it, I don't think. I think that was made, uh, uh, you know, obviously they were uh, uh, living in the country and they would sort of be aware of certain things unconsciously as well. But it was certainly not propaganda in, in that sense. You know, we would have in the West had similar films uh, that were also made in the spirit of the time. Um, and uh, But afterwards, when then certain political events happened, that would have then caused the problem because they thought, oh, damn, you know, they have um, just shown this film and people escaped with the balloon. The other one with the jet plane, the one we saw, uh, was also a bit of an issue because there was a guy from West Germany who flew via different countries in Finland into uh, Russia and landed on the Red Square with his little plane in Moscow and he had broken through all the defense systems of the Soviet Union. This was an incredible breach of uh, security. It uh, led to a total upheaval. They uh, actually uh, um, sacked several high-ranking generals in the military um, because of that ha having been uh, uh, possible. And uh, so you get things like that which happen then and then you look at the Sandmännchen or the, the people who are in charge would then maybe say, oh my god, you know, this is really not, not the best thing to have uh, uh, shown just when that happened or, uh, you know, but it's, uh, that's often an afterthought, I think. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, very, that's very interesting that, uh, yeah, these things are detected afterwards rather than uh, in the actual uh, yeah. production. But uh, Jude, do you want to tell us about the next film? Yeah, those two films we've just seen were from a slightly earlier period and from this last film, this last film's right at the end of the, the wall is already coming down at the point when this was shown. And it's more of an abstract kind of movie. And it reminds me of things that we were making and watching in art colleges at the time in um, London or anywhere that I knew anyway. Um, and 
in the three films that I've shown, uh, you can look at the sort of art house development over time. The um, one by Sieglinde Ein Kefig was 1981, the, the cage, the hand-drawn one. Um, the Klaus Gorgi, he was, he's made lots and lots of films um, as well as Sieglinde, both of them very important regular animators for DEFA. Um, but you can see that mixed media, and that's something I really like to see. And you could see it in other East German animation, this sort of juxtaposition of media. Um, this next one is by Ulrich Lindner. I couldn't find much about him, actually. Um, Zeit Verlaufe. It's more abstract. It's called Over Time, and it seems to be... It, it's using photography much more and um, it seems to fit into that kind of animation where people started to look back to early film and the experiments in photography of the early cin uh, filmmakers places to to look back to that very early film period and use it as inspiration um, for new generation of art films. It seems to me to fit into that um, international art film tradition at the time or a bit earlier perhaps. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's watch the next film. Let's go. Oh, have I got my screen share thing on? Right, I've got to do that again, silly old me. Um, share screen, movies, TV. It won't let me do optimize for video clip, so I will just do my best to optimize manually. Right, here it goes. So Jude and Bettina, the date on that was 1990, so the year after the wall came down. Can you detect anything in the imagery or, or the sensibility of the film that might locate it in that period? Are we to suppose there is a, a connection between all that uh, imagery of, of ruins and desolation? Are we meant to equate that with um, the political situation of the time? How, sh how should we read it? <laughs> um, I mean, Jude, Well, I was going to say, um, knowing the time, you can't help for myself. I can't help but read analogies. But but as an outsider, I that's just how I read it. I think it's one of those films as well that you are supposed to come bring yourself to it. I think you know. I don't think you're supposed not supposed to be given to you as a. You're supposed to feel it, but. But yeah, for me, I mean, there, there's mm. some commentary that I couldn't, that I didn't, uh, couldn't translate the German. Maybe you could have that. I, I, I think uh, it, it, because the ending, you know, there were so many war images and what strikes me particularly strongly, and I think why it's so brilliant, is that tightrope walk. And this is what my parents, and I know from a lot of people from East Germany, it was a constant tightrope walk, not to set a, a foot wrong. So you had all this stuff happening underneath you and you were trying to walk across it without uh, slipping. Uh, because uh, that's part of the reason why also my uh, family escaped, because it was always very difficult and you know people would be informing on each other and were sort of influenced to inform on each other, you know, and sometimes bullied into it. And uh, so this title walk expresses that very strongly. And, uh, and then, of course, also uh, the system breaks down. And so the ending is very much like that whole idea of socialism. It wasn't really even communism. It was socialism uh, um, has broken down because the system, the old system and the old guard that was in charge couldn't reform. And therefore, the whole idea of socialism fell to pieces. So you have this bare earth. And um, if you're hopeful, you would think 
from that now something else can grow. You know, I was almost thinking now the last shot would be a tiny little plant coming up through the cracks. As I have seen myself in the no man's land between East Berlin and West Berlin, where the wall was, there was no man's land on both sides. And one particular section, there was an old road, concrete, you know, that sort of road surface, uh, concrete, I think it was in those days. And through the concrete, this one little plant had come through, you know, and I always thought that was so cliche, but it was so symbolic as well. And I had almost hoped that the film would do that, but obviously at the time things were so raw that they just saw the, the uh, destruction of an idea and of a, a system uh, that could have gone further but didn't make it. Um, and so hence the sad ending.